story you are about to see is a fib, but it's short. The names are made up, but the problems are real. MathNet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 60 minutes, in cooperation with CTW, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case, from beginning to end. From crime to punishment, MathNet is the story of your mathematicians in action. It was Monday, 9.43 a.m., and the mood among the native New Yorkers was angry. They were upset about the economy. They were angry about the increase in the sales tax, the property tax, the entertainment tax, the value-added tax, the value-subtracted tax, the taxi tax, and the carpet tax. Even New York doctors were upset. Their patients had been taxed. But I was just happy to be living in this exciting megalopolis, taxing though it is. My partner is George Frankly, the boss is Joe Greco, and my name is Tuesday. I'm a mathematician. Cat committed suicide? Yep. Shot itself in the head nine times. <laughs> <laughs> I've been around a lot of sadness lately. Really? Oh, yes. I had my flu shot yesterday. You did? Yeah. I had to. It broke its leg. <laughs> <laughs> but the news hasn't been all that. I just signed a contract with MGM. That's terrific. Yeah. Now all I gotta do is get them to sign it. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, hi, Pat. Come in. Charlie was just doing some material for his routine. Charlie? Charlie McStick. Charlie, I'd like you to meet my partner, Pat Tuesday. Oh, it's a pleasure, Miss Tuesday. And meet my ventriloquist, Edgar Bergman. Nice to meet you, Charlie, I'm sure. And you, Edgar? Edgar is a dummy. Oh? I mean, he's not talking. Well, at the moment. He, he was, but... That's why we're here. Where are you usually? Usually? Well, I was born in Northern California. Where? Sequoia National Park. When? Ash Wednesday. Ever pine for it? Occasionally I balsam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's enough, you two. What the heck is going on here? Pat, they were here when I came in. Who? Charlie and Edgar. I don't think Edgar is here yet. Well, that's the point. Charlie, why don't you tell her? Charlie's gonna tell me and Edgar's gonna sit there? That's right. What an act. Does Edgar drink a glass of water while Charlie talks? M Miss Tuesday, I, I know it sounds strange, but, well, we used to be Charlie, Edgar, and Lolly. A terrific act. Used to be? That's right, until Lolly turned up missing. And that's why we're not doing the ASFAS benefit. ASFAS? A-S-F-A-S. As fast, the award show for the award shows. It's one of the most prestigious television shows in the history of the medium, Pat. Yeah, where are you then? Is that the award show that gives awards to shows that give awards to shows that get awards? Exactly right. As fast. They reward shows like the Oscars, the Tonys, the Emmys, the Patsies, the Golden Globes, the Aces, the Yorkies. The Yorkies? Well, that's the award show that gives awards to the most unusual pizza toppings. Anyway, they were gonna host the show. But Lolly is missing. Yes. We had just come back from playing a bunch of one-nighters in the Midwest. One-nighters? In showbiz, a one-nighter means doing one show a night, each in a different city. Anyway, when we arrived back in New York and got off a plane, Lolly was missing. Without Lolly, the act is ruined, and Astas canceled us. Where is Lolly? She couldn't have gotten off the plane in mid-flight, could she? No. The way we travel is Edgar flies first class, and Lolly and I don't. You fly coach? No. Economy? Baggage. We get put in the suitcases and then into the belly of the plane. When we reach our destination, Edgar picks us up off the baggage claim carousel. It's a lousy ride, but we get frequent suitcase miles. Sometimes we upgrade to under the seat. <laughs> but this time, when they arrived in LaGuardia... I was there, but Lolly wasn't. And the suitcase was gone? No, the case was there. Edgar picked us up. We got to the apartment. He opened mine up. Then he opened Lolly's. And... And what? And he just said, Oh, no! It's the wrong case! Then he slammed the case shut. And he hasn't spoken since. That's why I brought in here. This is bizarre. Yes, it is, Pat, but go along with it. 
Charlie needs our help. What was in the other suitcase? Beats me. He closed it. I heard a couple of clicks, and that's all she wrote. Where's the suitcase? In our apartment. Shall we? OK. But only if you write the report. We motored to Charlie's apartment, a two-bedroom suite in a complex called The Broken Arms. Have a look around. Make yourselves at home. Gee, Pat, he's got some neato stuff. These are really great pictures. Boy, Charlie, you know a lot of celebrities. Yeah, when you've been in this business as long as we have, that happens. Charlie, is it true what they say about Jerry Mahoney? George. Sorry. Where's the other case? Over there. It's locked with a combination lock. Great, it's a three-digit combination. Each could be zero through nine. It's set at six, three, eight. Yeah, there are a lot of possibilities. 10 to the third, 1,000 possible combinations. What are you talking about? The number of different settings this lock has. We might have to try 1,000 combinations to find the right one. It could take a while. Wait a minute. If this isn't Edgar's case, how did he open it up? Don't ask me. I'm just a dummy when it comes to math. Maybe it was unlocked. Wait a minute. Charlie, you said when Edgar closed the case, you heard two clicks. Yes. Are you sure? I swear on my mother's bark. One click would have happened when he closed the latch. And the other might have been when he changed one of the digits. All right, if that's the case... Maybe he only changed one digit. The case would still be locked, but would have only six possibilities. Why six? If he changed only one of these three digits and moved that one either up a click or down, then there are only two ways he could have changed it. I get it. Three digits, two ways to change each digit. Three times two is six. Very good, Charlie. See, you're no math dummy. Yeah, but we don't know which of the three he changed. We'll just have to undo what he did when he locked the case. That's an example of a reversible operation. Try it, Pat. I'll try six to five. That one doesn't work. I'll try six to seven. Doesn't work either. Now I'll try three to two. Uh-uh. And three to four. No luck again. OK. If our hypothesis is correct, six and three are part of the combination, but eight is not. Hypothesis. Uh, sort of like a guess, right? So that would mean the third number has to be the one he changed. We'll see. I'll try moving this up one. That's a problem-solving tool called trial and error, Charlie, my boy. Trial and error, eh? Good name, but... The what? But, but open, open the, the case. case. Oh, oh, open the case, of course. Boy, you're going to be sorry. Sorry about what? But it isn't your case. What do you mean? Look. MathNet will return after this message. With every summer comes beautiful days when all concerns for what to wear can be solved with just a little suntan lotion. But there are days when it's darn well important what you're wearing. Uh-oh, here's a situation where a lot of hot tea just won't be enough. What you really need is a new kind of glove, giving you, above all, that most important element of you, personality. Once you acquire one of our multi-gloves with five interchangeable fingers, each a different color, you'll find yourself able to make the same color combinations as someone who owns virtually dozens and dozens of ordinary gloves. You find that hard to believe? Well, go ahead. Just guess how many different combinations you can make. One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 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 one hundred twenty possible combinations. And why so many? Because if you arrange five different colored fingers in all possible ways, you will arrive at five times four times three times two times one combinations, which is exactly one hundred twenty. And imagine the possibilities if people had six fingers. Multi gloves available at your nearest better glove compartment. Wow. I wish I had said that. Bet there's over a million bucks here. Want to go to lunch? If you think Edgar was shocked, wait till the other guy opens his case. What do you mean? If you had a suitcase with a million bucks in it, and got home and found out it had been switched for a dummy named Lollipop. I see what you mean. Well, what are you doing? I'm calling the airlines. May I? Just leave the quarters of the call by the phone. Yeah. <laughs> what airlines did you fly, Charlie? I don't know. From where I ride, they all look the same. TWM, Transworld Merge, Flight 13. Who are you calling them? What can they tell you? Number for TWM, please. Bags get switched at airports all the time. When they do, you call them and they can trace them for you. Yeah, well, I guess if I lost a million bucks on an airplane, I'd check it out. Well, locate the other traveler and just switch the bags back. Yeah. Know what I'm going to say to Lolly when she gets home? What? Lolly, you look like a million, a million bucks. bucks. What's the name, Pat? Strange. What? No one has called. Charlie, when did you get in? Last night. Maybe he hasn't missed his bag yet. Maybe. But if you had a million dollars in your suitcase, wouldn't you open it to check? I don't know. Martha always handles stuff like that. Charlie, if it's okay with you for safekeeping, we're going to take this money to MathNet. I'll write you out a receipt. Sure thing. Charlie, we'll stay on top of this. As soon as the other guy calls, we'll let you know. And arrange to make the switch and get Lolly back. Thanks, Pat and George. I really appreciate your help. And so would Edgar, if he could. He'll snap out of it, Charlie, as soon as Lolly's back in the fold. I sure hope so. He's due to spray me. Spray you? My family has a history of Dutch elm disease. <laughs> <laughs> passed and it was Tuesday, 10.43 a.m., and I put in another call to Transworld Merge. Okay, thanks very much. Well, it didn't take you long to spend the money. Sergeant Abruzzi put it under lock and key in the police property room. It'll be safe there, Pat. Yuck! What's the matter? Well, the, the, the cookie I was dunking dropped off. I thought this was it, but silly me, I, I bit the tea bag. George, it's been over 24 hours and still nobody has called about the missing suitcase. That's very unusual. Look at all these tags. I mean, this suitcase has done some traveling. You know, maybe this case wasn't meant to be offloaded in New York. What do you mean? I mean, maybe the plane went on to another destination after it stopped here. And the owner went with it, but the suitcase didn't. Let's check with TWM. Attention, please. Amelia Earhart, please go to a white courtesy telephone. Your luggage has been found. Yes, sir. How may I serve you? Deregulatedly. Hello, young aviatrix. I'd like you to check this bag to Atlanta, Georgia, this one to Spokane, Washington, and this one to San Juan, Puerto Rico. I'm afraid that's impossible, sir. Why, what do you mean? You did it last week! Hello. And where are we flying today? We're not. Uh, at least, not now. Then you've come to the right airline. All our flights are delayed. 
We'd like to ask you some questions about baggage handling. I'm afraid I'm too busy at the moment. Perhaps anon. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Singletary can help you. These people have some questions about baggage, Mr. Singletary. Won't you step into my office? Flight 313 to Sioux City, Iowa is ready for boarding. If you are already bored, don't go. You ask how we know where to send Travis' luggage. Yes, sir. With all the flights to all the cities, how do the suitcases ever get to where they're supposed to? This map shows major airports in the United States and Canada. Each airport has a three-letter code. There are 26 letters in the alphabet. 26 to the third, or 17,576 different combinations. Wow. Did you just work that out in your head? No, it comes up all the time. We're interested in the New York airport. Well, the New York area has three major airports, Pat. Right. Kennedy, JFK, LaGuardia, LGA, and Newark, EWR. They each have a code. If you were to fly to New York from, say... Ooh. Los Angeles, California. All right. Los Angeles, California. LAX. I used to live there. I know, George. Well, Los Angeles, I mean. In the valley. I think I could have guessed that. Nevertheless, you check your bags at Los Angeles, and you get a claim check. JFK is printed on the check. We write on your flight number and attach it to your luggage. JFK or LGA or EWR. Right, depending at which airport your flight is scheduled to arrive. The baggage handlers put the proper bags on the proper plane so that when you get there, so does your luggage. But well, then why do bags sometimes get switched? On your claim check, there's a serial number. It matches the one on your suitcase. And someone is there to make sure the numbers match, right? In theory. But sometimes airports are so busy, they don't have an attendant to check every bag. And suitcases do look alike. So you should always check to make sure you got the right one. Occasionally, people are in a hurry, and they don't. Mix-ups can occur. Mr. Singletary, could you look at the tag on this suitcase and tell us where it was supposed to be offloaded? This bag was put on our flight 13 from Columbus, Ohio, to New York's LaGuardia Airport. LGA. Did flight 13 continue on from New York? No, it terminated. The plane wasn't used again until the next day when it went back into service. So whoever this suitcase belongs to had to have gotten off the plane in New York. That's right. Thank you, sir. Nothing at all? No inquiries about a suitcase from Flight 13? Thanks, sir. Oh, I... I... Sorry, ma'am. George. Why doesn't he call the airlines about his money? Beats me. What's that? It's a graph. According to the claim checks on our mystery suitcase, these are the cities it saw. The lines show the only direct connection between these pairs. Think we may trace the owner that way? Maybe. But the problem is, except for the last trip from Columbus to New York, all the flight numbers are missing. So we know the suitcase went to the cities, but we don't know in which order. Here's one way it could have gone. George, that's a Hamiltonian circuit. I did a paper on those at MathNet U. I quell over Hamiltonian circuits. Then you know it shows a path around the graph which visits each city once and only once. Each segment of the graph is called an edge. No edge is used twice. Well, let's look for another way. Start in New York. Couldn't have gone to Columbus, because we know it returned from there, and that would use Columbus twice. Right. How about New York, Cincinnati, then on to Cedar Rapids, to Rochester, to Chicago, to Toledo, to New York. That leaves out Columbus. OK. We know that it returned from Columbus to New York. Now, New York to Chicago to Rochester to 
to Cedar Rapids, to Cincinnati, to Columbus, to New York. Leaves out Toledo. I think I've got it. New York, to Toledo, to Cincinnati, to Cedar Rapids, Rochester, to Chicago, to Columbus, to New York. That works. And these are the only two ways it could have made the circuit. But that still doesn't explain why he hasn't called about his suitcase. You know, Pat, maybe the guy who owns the suitcase hasn't called because he can't. You mean he can't get to a phone? Well, what if the money is illegal? Illegal? Yeah, what if it's drug money or, I don't know, illegal gambling money or stolen money? What if he ripped off the mob? So if he calls the airlines and they've opened up the suitcase, someone might think he has money that he isn't supposed to have. Exactly. But now if he thinks another traveler has his money, he'll want it back. That means Edgar and Charlie could be in danger. But they don't have the money. But he doesn't know that. I'll call Charlie. You better get over there. Hello, Charlie. This is George Frankly, MathNet. Someone may be after you and the money. Lock your doors and open them for no one. We're on our way. Not wanting to call attention to our problem by running, and to save cab fare, George and I walked with cautious surreptitiousness to Charlie's apartment. You'll love Square One TV. It's preferred by two out of three doctors, three out of four dentists, and 21 out of 20 teachers of fractions. Everyone who's seen it says it's chock full of math, dancing, singing, problem solving, laughing, and of course, MathNet every day. It's been called amazing, sensational, colossal. Look for it on your very own television set. Not available at theaters and drive ins all over. Square One TV. Catch it or it will fall on the floor. Charlie, are you all right? I'll mow you down. I'll give you a left and a right. Stay in there all night of yous. Charlie. Oh, oh, sorry. When George called, I guess he couldn't have it on edge. On edge? Wars have been won with less firepower. Charlie, you're going to have to stay on guard. The person who has Lolly may be a crook. And he may be looking for you to get his money back. But I haven't got his money. Besides, how's he going to find me? Well, he's he's got Lolly, so he's got to know he's looking for a ventriloquist. Good point, George. He'll trace her. How would he do that? I'd begin at the beginning. Trees? After that. Ventriloquist dummy makers. We should ask Benny to check on it. May I? Oh, be my guest. Oh, you know where else a guy might check? Where? Where? With show business agents, the people who get jobs for us. Do you have an agent? 
One of the best. What's his name? Her name is Broadway Annie Rose. <laughs> Ma'am? What is your show business speciality? Juggling, singing, eating, math? Math net. We don't get much call for math net. You ever do math without a net? You misunderstand. We're with math net and we'd like to see Broadway Annie. Are you Broadway Annie? The sun will come out. Thanks for seeing us, Broadway Annie. Likewise, I'm sure. Now, what can I do for you? We'd like to ask you about one of your clients. Mm -hmm. Three of them, actually. Charlie, Edgar, and Molly. Great act. Want to book them? No. Anything wrong? Yes. Lolly's been dummy net. <gasps> That's terrible. Any suspects? Not really. Woodpeckers is where I'd put my dough. If not woodpeckers, termites. We don't think so, Broadway Annie. But we want to know if anyone's asked about them. No. They just finished a tour I booked for them. You're their agent, right? Right. I'm their 10 percenter. 10 percenter? That's right. Talent agents are called 10 percenters because we get 10 percent of the money our clients receive. That doesn't seem fair. Do my ears detect sass? No, but. Hey, agents are entitled to at least that much for putting up with these artists. Besides, I get them the gigs, and scheduling ain't easy. You mean you find jobs for your clients? Right. Not only get them jobs, I have to schedule their travel. Now, here is their last tour. I sent them from New York to Detroit. They performed in Detroit? No, in a town called Ann Arbor, Michigan. But see, that's my problem. You can't fly into a lot of these little birds. Next, they played in Middletown, Ohio. No flights, right? You got it. So I route them to Dayton. They rent a car and drive to Middletown. Then they flew on to Des Moines, Minneapolis, Columbus, and New York. In fact, they just got back a couple of days ago. Just out of curiosity, how much money did they make for this tour? 75000 So you got 10% of 75000 That's right. 7500 You have a nice business. Hey, it's not always big bucks, lady, let me tell you. Did you see the foot juggler out front? Uh-huh. You didn't shake with him, did you? No, why? The last guy who did got athlete's hand. Anyway, he hasn't had a job since I booked him for a podiatrist luncheon in Soho. Paid $47.50. $4,750? $47.50. I made $4.75. Hardly covers the Desinex. <laughs> I take it back, Annie. You really do earn your 10%. You can bet your sweet smile on it, Toots. <laughs> Annie, if anyone inquires about Charlie and Edgar, I'll give you a blast on the horn. Or call us on the phone if it's easier. What was that? Thanks, Mules. Right on time after a buffo week at the Kit Kat Club. <laughs> oh, you might wish to use the back stairs. Okay, thank you. Penny? Yep, you got the word out among ventriloquist dummy makers. So far, no one's contacted them, but they'll call. What are you doing with the money? They counted it. How much? One million bucks, exactly. Tidy little sum. George, look at this. What? This money's from different cities. So? The Bank of Columbus. Here's a bunch from the Des Moines Trust. The Ann Arbor Savings. Money comes from different banks, Pat. That's not unusual. No, it isn't. The rest of the money's from Minneapolis and Dayton. 
five cities. Yes. The same five cities just visited by our friends Charlie, Edgar, and Lolly. Don't go away. We'll come back to MathNet after this brief break. So I figured I'd be better off with a small business loan to get started. Mm hmm Just to pay expenses up front, that kind of thing. Sure. First thing he said when he started working out the loan was, show me your first day's profit. I don't make loans to failing businesses. Do you believe him? Yeah. So I say, profit? I'll show you profit. I pick up my pencil and lay it all out. My profit is equal to my revenue minus my expenses. What are your expenses? The containers plus the mix. So I add $2.58 for the containers. OK. And $3.39 for the mix. All right. So the total expenses are $5.97. Hmm, almost six bucks. Yeah. Strong market? I completely sold out, 32 orders. So your revenue is 32 times your selling price, which was? I set it at 30 cents. 30 cents? This is a business. 32 times 30 cents is $9.60. Now, revenue minus expenses, $9.60 minus $5.97, and there's my profit, a little more than 360. That makes sense. In one day, I said, now that's profit. I'd like to borrow $25 to keep up the cash flow. What did he say? He said yes. Your little brother said yes? Well, I have to give him free lemonade every time he stops by the stand. Small price to pay? Yeah, well... By the way, where does he get his money? Nobody knows. In every occupation, wherever you may go, When I learned of the coincidence of the five cities, I contacted the police in each of them. We wanted to see if there'd been any bank robberies in those cities. I take it there were? Just a couple of banks. Oh? In Ann Arbor, a bank was robbed. They got $325,000. Is this piddly little amount a bank robbery in Columbus, Ohio? No, that's the Honors Program Scholarship Fund at Ohio State. Too bad. Thought they didn't get much. Wiped it out, that's all. In Des Moines, they knocked over an armored car. How about Dayton? A shopping mall. And Minneapolis? Another bank. Total take, $1,285,302. So if this is the money, we're short by nearly 300 grand. You bringing in Edgar and Charlie for questioning? I've sent their pictures to various police departments to see if they can get IDs. Things don't look good for them. Captain, I know they didn't do it. Me too. I hope I'm wrong, Math Netters. Math Net Tuesday. Oh, yes. Right away. The DA wants to see us, George. The district attorney? She may have gotten the ID reports. She's a tough taskmaster. But she's fair. Good. Except in court. She's a bulldog. Should we talk to her or pet her? You wanted to see us, District Attorney Wofford? Yes. Take a seat. Boy, DAs have spiffier offices than mathematicians. We don't even have a couch. I didn't ask you up here to admire my couch. Good, because I don't admire it. Just make an observation. I have one like this in my whoopee room. I understand you've become friendly with the guilty parties. Guilty parties? The robbers, Edgar Bergman and Charlie McStick. Yes, they're friends, but I must have missed the trial when they were found guilty of robbery. The trial in this case, Mr. Frankly, is a mere formality. What do you mean? They were identified as the holdup men in Ann Arbor, Dayton, Des Moines, Minneapolis, and Columbus. Positive identification. And we caught them with the money. We didn't catch them with the money. They surrendered it. Don't be a nitpicker. May I see the reports? 
No. This show's running long as it is. Take my word for it. They were identified. What are you going to do, Ms. District Attorney? Do? <laughs> Nothing. I've already done it. They're in New York's finest jail. The tombs in Lower Manhattan? No. The tomes under the New York Public Library. Just thought you might like to know, softies. I never like going to jail. I don't mind going. I hate staying. Have you ever done time, George? Well, at MathNet University, we had to spend one day in jail just so we'd know what it was like. I didn't have to do that at MathNet U. Yeah, they changed the requirements by the time you got there. What was jail like? Nice place to visit, but... I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to live there. there. <laughs> I'm afraid Charlie and Edgar will be mortified by being in jail. Yeah. Jail knocks the starch out of people. I'm too young to die. I want to see the sunrise again. Stop and smell the roses. Feel the wind through my knot hole. Easy, Charlie. Easy. Get me a mouthpiece. Get me a rewrite. Get me a ham sandwich. Charlie, calm down. Hold the mail. I'm sorry, Pat and George. Jail always does this to me. Have you been in jail before? No, that I've seen a lot of bad prison movies. George, did you ever see Life Was But a Song? He lived in Sing Sing? No, but I once took a river trip on a raft named George. This is serious, Charlie. You swear you didn't commit those robberies? Absolutely. But they have witnesses in Ann Arbor, Minneapolis, Des Moines, Dayton, and Columbus who will swear you did. They're lying. Minneapolis? Did you say Minneapolis? Yes, why? Because we weren't in Minneapolis. Come off it, Charlie. Broadway Annie Rose said she booked you there. She did, but we didn't do the show. Why not? We were snowed out, that's why not. We couldn't get there. A terrible blizzard. Really? Would I lie? I don't know. I would in your position. <laughs> yeah. Where were you when you were supposed to be in Minneapolis? In the bus station in Des Moines. We were waiting for the weather to clear. Finally, even the bus trip was canceled, so we flew to the next show in Columbus, Ohio. Thanks, pal. We've got some work to do. We'll be in touch. You know where I'll be. Oh, if I had wings like an angel, over these prison walls I would fly. And I'd fly to the arms of my poor darling, and there I'd be willing to die. Wednesday, 1.43 p.m., we asked Captain Greco to do some sleuthing for us while George checked the bag's travel itinerary and I checked the eye dents. The witnesses say a man in a top hat and silk scarf and a dummy, both with masks, did the robbing. They swear it was Charlie and Edgar. Well, if Charlie is telling the truth, then the guy in Minneapolis is wrong. Because Charlie and Edgar say they weren't there. Well, Captain Greco is checking on the story. Pat, have you called the airlines recently? Yes. No one has inquired about the suitcase. Hi, Captain Greco. Did you check with the promoter in Minneapolis? Sure did. And Charlie told the truth. They couldn't get in because of the weather. They're out of jail. What's the chart? I've highlighted in orange Charlie and Edgar's itinerary. Skipper, you made a Hamiltonian circuit. Yeah, I love them. I make them every chance I get. Me too. <laughs> they were scheduled to go from New York to Detroit, to Dayton, to Des Moines, to Minneapolis, to Columbus, and back again to New York. Just a darn minute. Look at this. These two Hamiltonian circuits are almost the same shape. Hmm. I'll be hornswoggled if you're not right. Well, the case could have been following Edgar and Charlie. Let's ask the airlines to pull passenger lists on these routes. Maybe one of the passengers from the Columbus to New York flight will show up on the rest of the Hamiltonian. Thanks, Captain. That helps a lot. Then I'll... Uh, I've got some people checking on whether there were other ventriloquists doing shows in those areas. I'll get back to you on that shortly. Tuesday, frankly. What are you doing to my case? What do you mean, Ms. District Attorney? I just heard those two criminals are getting out on bail on some technicality. 
We don't want to see you involved in a miscarriage of justice. A miscarriage of what? Justice. Oh. Charming example of the legal profession, huh? Any luck, Skipper? Not much, I'm afraid. Were there any other ventriloquists out there? Well, near Ann Arbor, there was a ventriloquist in Ypsilanti at a mall opening. Here's a local review. And that called Nosebleed and Snurred. Do they appear anywhere else? Not that I found so far. Sorry. Thanks, Captain. Hey, you two. Or you one. It's good to see you. Thanks for arranging bail, Mathnitters. I owe you one. What did you have to put up? Well, 10,000 for Edgar and Electric Sander for you. Ever hear of a ventriloquist act called, what is it, George? Nosebleed and snurred? No. Well, yeah, maybe. Uh, there's a stirring in the sawdust of my mind. Edgar would probably know them. Why? Just a hunch. I'm going to call Broadway Annie. Any change in Edgar? Not really. This morning, when I was drinking a glass of juice, I thought I saw his lips move once, but no, no change. Well, he'll come around. Charlie, if you didn't do those robberies, you may have been set up. You mean someone one of them make people think it was us? Exactly. Now, who would have such a motive? Who are your enemies? We don't have any. We are the love. And the first love who says we aren't gets a burrow in the slats. <laughs> well, who would stand to gain if you guys were behind bars? The other inmates. We had those cons in stitches. Well, you said you were going to do that big television show. Yes, tomorrow night. As fast. As fast? As fast. Right, as fast. The award show for the award shows. But with Lolly missing, you lost the job. Right. Well, who got it? An act I never heard of. Merlin and the Munchkins. Guess what Annie said about Snurd and Nosebleed? What? She says Snurd hates Edgar and has for years. Why? Professional jealousy. But he's jealous of the money and fame Edgar has? That's about it. Annie says nosebleed and snurred are a terrible act. Does she handle them? No. Nope. No one will. They book their own gigs. Anything from mall openings to birthday parties. They're a couple of losers. Good afternoon, D.A. Wofford. How may we be of service to your career? Thought you'd like to know. About half of the money stolen from the five cities is traceable. You mean the banks had records of the serial numbers? Exactly. So we checked your million dollars. And? And none of the money matches. But if half of the stolen money was marked, and they stole 1,300,000... Then some of it would have to match. That's right. So we looked at the money a little more closely. It's queer. Queer? Counterfeit. counterfeit. Ever been arrested for counterfeiting, dummy? Remember plant a spoon, that miraculous product that did away with mismatching spoons forever? You don't. Sure you do. Remember to assure yourself of always having a pair of spoons of the same color. All you had to do, to be sure, was plant three identical-looking plant-a-spoon seeds. Then you could be sure your third seed would sprout a red or a blue, and you'd have a matching pair. Now, at last, to be sure introduces... New and improved plant a spoon. That's right. What an idea, and an idea that was inspired by you, our faithful audience. You wrote and phoned and sent wires and said, What about an out of color? And that's just what we've done. We've still got red and blue, but we've added yellow to the team. Now you can have a matching pair of handy, ready-to-use spoons just by planting these identical-looking seeds. How many seeds, you ask? No idea? Uh-huh. Here's an idea. Watch. You might get a pair of matching spoons with two seeds. Or not. You might get a pair with three seeds. But not necessarily. To be sure, plant four seeds. That way, if your first three spoons are different colors, you know the fourth seed will match one of them. See that? 
Don't delay. Order your new and improved Plant a Spoon now. Each package includes 75 seeds, 25 for each color, plus easy to follow instructions. How many seeds would you have to plant to make sure you get a pair of matching yellow spoons? To be sure, it's to be sure. Void where prohibited by intelligent legislation. We had one million dollars of counterfeit money, but the robberies amounted to 1.3 million. Where was the real missing money? That was a street person. Oh? The guy who knows what's happening illegal-wise. His name is Blinky Eisenglass, and he runs a shoe shine stand as a front. Come on. Can you tell if it's counterfeit? Well, you look at a lot of things, Miss Tuesday. You look to make sure the portrait is clear and distinct, and make sure the serial numbers are evenly spaced, that the bordering lines aren't blurred. And here, you make sure the treasury seal is clear. <laughs> this is fake. How does one get counterfeit loot? One pays money for it. You buy it? Yep, 20 points on the buck. You think illegal money is free? Oh, 20 points? 20 points. A point is a percentage point. 20% of what? 20% of the whole. 20% of the 100%. So if I wanted to buy a counterfeit dollar bill, it would cost me 20%. 20 cents. If I wanted to buy a counterfeit $100 bill... 20 bucks, if you pass it and get away with it. it. It's like real money. If you get caught, you do real time. In prison. So a million dollars worth of counterfeit money would cost... $200,000. George, our man could have spent $200,000 to buy $1 million of bogus money. And he would have had the rest of the robbery money left over. Walking around, Doe. Come on. Blinky, thanks for talking with no us. No problem. I love math net. I want to be a mathematician when I grow up. When you grow up? Yeah. I I'm young at heart, Miss Tuesday. <laughs> How do you like that? They stiffed me. <laughs> Are you positive? Thanks very much. That was the airlines, Pat. They've identified a name that is common to all these flights. The name? Floyd Snurd. Snurd Nosebleed. But George, Snurd went to different cities than Charlie and Edgar did. Different cities, yes, but cities that were very close to Edgar's route. And the dates from the airline fit. Look, the first robbery was near Detroit. Toledo is near Detroit. The second was in Dayton. Cincinnati isn't far. The next is Des Moines. Cedar Rapids isn't far. Yes, but what about the next one? I see what you mean. Charlie and Edgar couldn't get to Minneapolis because of the weather. But the airline said that Snurr did fly from Cedar Rapids to Rochester. He must have gotten in before the weather turned bad. He could have rented a car and pulled the robbery. Right. Snurr had no way of knowing that Charlie's performance would be canceled. I'll check Rent-A-Car and see if Snurd did that. I'll see if I can get an address. Folks, meet Ebenezer Squeeze. Tell him what you do, Squeeze. <laughs> I'm a landlord. Tell him why you're here, Mr. S. Well, I was collecting my rent envelopes, you know, doing some evictions, turning the heat off in some of my buildings. Get on you know, with little... it. Well, anyway, I was owed some back rent. And when I went to deposit the cash, the bank said it was hot money. He had five $100 bills from the armored car robbery in Des Moines. Where did you get them? From a tenant. A fellow by the name of Floyd Snurd. What's the address? 1313 13th Place. Thanks for helping us catch a despicable villain. <laughs> it won't do you any good. I mean, he packed up this morning, lock, stock, and barrel, and left. I think he went to Costa Rica. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I'll put an all-points bulletin on him, but... Yeah, that's closing APP doors after the ventriloquist has left. Hello, Charlie. Any change in Edgar? 
No, I'm afraid he's still out there. Fortunately, Snurt is too. Maybe in Costa Rica. Yep, we got the right answer to the problem just a little late. Maybe the Costa Rican authorities will find him and send him back for trial. Well, my guess is with over a million dollars, he'll change his appearance and lead the life of... Oh, really? No, O'Reilly. Actually, I dropped by to see if you want to go to the Aspects. Aspects? Yeah, the award show. It starts in an hour. Uh, maybe some other time, Charlie. Thanks anyway. Okay, well, I just want to catch the guy who's subbing for us. It's a ventriloquist with a magic act. The lady at Asfas says Merlin cuts one of the munchkins in half for a finale. Should be good for a laugh. See ya. Matt, Matt, frankly. Oh, hi, Annie. Well, thanks for your help. It doesn't make much difference anymore anyway. Broadway Annie said no one's ever heard of Merlin and the munchkins. George. Matt? George, how did Asfast notify Charlie and Edgar that they'd been replaced? Charlie never mentioned how. He just said they got informed. How could they? Edgar's been comatose ever since he found Lolly missing. Who are you calling? Asfast. Asfast? Hello, Asfast. It's Pat Tuesday with MathNet. You're sponsoring the show tonight, which was going to feature Charlie, Edgar, and Lolly, right? I wonder if you mind telling me why you canceled them. I see. How did you notify Edgar? Could you fax those to us? Thank you. She said they received a letter, then they sent one. Anyway, she's going to fax it all over to us right away. We're not on the same page, Pat. Something doesn't add up. The Asfast promoter said she sent Edgar a letter. So, Edgar probably read it when he got back from his trip. Here it is. Dear Mr. Bergman, sorry to hear of your tragedy, but be notified that we have taken your advice and hired Merlin and the Munchkins. Thank you sincerely. What tragedy? Here's the one Asfas received. Dear Asfas, we will be unable to perform your upcoming show because Lolly is missing. Please be advised, as a substitute, I highly recommend an act called Merlin and the Munchkins, a delightful ventriloquist and magic act. Sorry for the inconvenience. Sincerely, Edgar Bergman. How could Edgar have written that letter? He, 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 he couldn't know that Lolly be missing. Exactly. And guess where the letter was mailed from? Rochester, Minnesota. Edgar wasn't even in Rochester, Minnesota. I know, but... Snurd was. Snurd set it up. He committed the robberies, and then he kept the real money to retire on. And framed Edgar, a man he's hated for years. And, and the thing of it is, he got away with it. Maybe not. Come on, Pard. Let's go to the award show as fast as we can. Lastly, let me say, I deserve, I deserve this award, award, and you don't. don't. I know we said we weren't coming, but we changed our minds. Good, good to see you here. Pull up a chair. How's Merlin? He's awful. Just awful. Makes one ashamed to be in this business we call show. Well, that's the final award of the evening. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to meet lovely little Lola. Well, my dear, care to sing us a song? Whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. And little See what I mean? This guy is terrible. His mouth moves more than hers does, and he can't carry a tune in a sedan chair. Lola wants... Lola gets... Resign yourself. Resign yourself. You're true. Well, if uh, one lovely little Lola is this good, imagine how good two lovely little Lolas can be. Oh, no! Don't saw me in half! It won't hurt, my dearest, not for long. Please, won't someone save me? Please do! Please don't! A pet! George, look! Edgar, he's coming out of it! Please save me! Save me! Wait, wait, that's not Lola, that's Lolly. 
and Merlin's really sawing her in half. Come on! Hey, Lolly, is that your hair? Or have the swallows returned to Captain Castrano? Oh, wait, boy, you bother me! Hello, Charles! Is that your nose? Or are you eating a banana? Listen, you fugitive from the forlorn fire. For two cents, I... For two cents, you do anything! Get back on the wood pile where you belong! Wally! Ladies and gentlemen, I, the great Merlin, for my final trip, shall disappear! Lloyd <laughs> Snurd, I presume. It is I, America's best kept secret, ventriloquism wise. Uh, you foiled me, sir, and I nearly ended Edgar Bergman's career and retired with my greatest triumph. The key word here is nearly, Snurd, you cad. And look, my old nemesis nosebleed, and you, you snurred. Ah, uh, you got me. But you gotta admit, would have been a great finish. Not as good as the finish we've got planned for you. It's probably the longest run you'll ever have. About 25 years. <laughs> Snurd, a.k.a. Merlin and the Munchkins, was tried in Manhattan in and for the state of New York. He was found guilty of a 170.15, forgery in the first degree, a 155.40, grand larceny in the second degree, and a 110.00, sawing a dummy. Nosebleed was found guilty of being a dummy and hanging with a bad ventriloquist. They are both in state's prison, where Nosebleed is studying law, hoping to become a mouthpiece. One hundred percent of MathNet is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. This program was made possible by grants from the National Science Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the financial support of viewers like you. Corporate funding of Square One TV is provided by the Intel Corporation Foundation. Intel's technology is the brain power for computers in your life. Intel the computer inside. This is PBS. These are the facts, just the facts. Tuesday and Frankly find themselves in yet another MathNet mystery. This time in the Bermuda Triangle. Don't miss a special hour of MathNet when Tuesday and Frankly take on the case of the Bermuda Triangle. Disappearing Clues, Sunday at noon.